Good evening. You ever been discussing the Bible with someone and you zero in on a certain passage and you give what you believe to be the interpretation of that passage and the person that you're discussing it with does not agree with you? And so you go back and forth and you talk about it and eventually the other person just throws up their hands and says, well, that's your interpretation. We all have our own interpretation. You know, it's, it's not logical to believe that we can all interpret the Bible in our own way and that every interpretation is correct. I mean, it's very similar to if you were driving down 1750 here and you were speeding and the cop pulled you over and he comes to the window and he says, do you realize how fast you were going? And you say, no, how fast was I going? He says, you were going 80. And you say, well, that's just your interpretation, right? That doesn't work. And it doesn't work when it comes to biblical things either. Now, I will grant you there are some passages of Scripture that seem to take on more than one interpretation, although there are not as many as some would like to believe. I'll give you a for, for instance. In John chapter 14, Jesus talks about how he goes to prepare a place for the apostles. In fact, what he actually says is, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. Many of you have probably always heard that that is talking about heaven. That's the place that Jesus is going to. I disagree a little bit. I mean, why would Jesus need to go to heaven to prepare a place? Heaven's been prepared since the foundation of the world, maybe longer, right? I mean, heaven has always been a prepared place. Where is Jesus going? I believe he's going to the cross to prepare a place. He's going to the cross and enduring that. He will be buried. He will rise again. That will prepare the way for us to be in heavenly communion for all eternity. But we can both have that view, I believe, without it being a line of fellowship. And there are some passages that are like that. But all in all, I think we have to say that it's a, it's a fallacy to believe that you can have your own interpretation, I can have mine, somebody else can have theirs, and somebody else can have theirs, and they can all be right and correct and valid. The Bible just doesn't work that way. That's not what God had in mind for us. You see... If God sent His Word that through the Holy Spirit, speaking to inspired men, wrote down the Word for us to have as a guidebook, as a compass, as a GPS, for us to live faithfully in this world so that we can see heaven in the next. If that is the case, then how can we claim that it's open to interpretation, and whatever interpretation you have is right and valid. You know, in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, we read, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. My only takeaway from that passage is that I need to be baptized, right? I don't know how you can take anything else from that passage, or take anything away from it to suggest that you don't have to be baptized, right? In fact, here's where interpretation gets real easy. Because you don't even really have to do a whole lot of interpreting here. I mean, sometimes the Bible is its best interpreter. Sometimes it's easy to discern. And here is one of those cases. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. But if we're led by preconceived notions, if we're led by denominational preferences or biases, we may likely miss a clear interpretation. Interpretation asks the question, what does this mean? What is God trying to say? It's not, what do I want this to mean? What do I want God to say here? No matter how difficult it may be to ingest and digest, we must ask the question and arrive at the conclusion that this is what God has said. And therefore, I must bend my will to it, not the other way around. What difference should this make in my life? How should this change my life? That's the next set of questions we must ask. As we've said before, the question we should always ask, whether it's after the sermon or after Bible study, is so what? So what? What does this have to do with me? How does this affect my life? What's the application here? Because you can be the best Bible student in the world in that you study, you memorize, and you can recite verse after verse. But if it doesn't change the way you live, then it's worthless. 
So we must answer the question, what is God trying to say? What does he mean here? And then, so what? How does that affect me? How do I bend my will to this? Proper interpretation of the Bible must include five keys. And those five keys are this. Content, context, comparison, culture, and consultation. There is a process to Bible study, as we've talked about throughout this series. It starts with observation, then there's interpretation, and then finally application. And when we're talking about interpretation, before we can ever apply anything, we have to look at the five C's of interpretation. What is God trying to say? Well, the only way that we can really clearly define that is to look at the five C's. And we start with content. How much error can be found in the religious world and in the realm of Bible study simply because someone has not done a proper job in dealing with the content. You hear me talk all the time about the perils of one verse theology, plucking a verse out and making it stand alone. And it's not just others outside of the churches of Christ that do this. We do this too. And we talked about some of those when we did the Twisted Scripture series, like Jeremiah 29 and 11, right? We do the same thing. One verse theology doesn't work. You have to consider content and context. Content is a, of a passage is the raw material. It's the database from which one interprets the text. When reading a passage, we are reading the content. That's easy, right? We are observing the content. And we're doing that in an effort to plow through it and to properly understand it and then, of course, to properly apply it. But then after the content, we have context. And you've heard about in real estate, the, the three keys to, to selling a piece of property is location, location, location. The three keys to proper Bible study is context, context, context. So many errors have been made in Bible study and application because of a failure to consider the context, right? Somebody bring a flashlight. <laughs> context is all about the connection between what went on before and what comes next. In order to understand the context of a passage, we must observe what surrounds it. A prime example of this is Romans 10, verses 9 and, and 10, maybe even a little further than that, going through verse 13. But here's a practice in one-verse theology. You hear it all the time. Somebody plucks out Romans 10, 9 and 10, and talks about how if you just believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that you'll be saved. And then a lot of times what's thrown in there is a makeshift prayer that's not found anywhere in the Bible that's maybe called a sinner's prayer. You recite that, you let Jesus into your heart, and you'll be saved. But what's the problem with that? You're not considering context. And you're not considering not only the context of Romans 10, you're not considering the context of Romans. You're not considering the context of which Paul is operating. Because the same Paul who wrote Romans 10, 9 and 10, talked at length about the symbolism of baptism in Romans chapter 6, and how necessary it was for the salvation of the sinner. The same Paul who wrote Romans 10, 9 and 10, also had this to say in Acts 22 and 16, where he recounts his conversion by saying that Ananias instructed him by saying, and now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. And so context is that important. You're going to miss a lot if you don't consider the context. And a lot of errors are made because we don't consider everything that's going on around a passage or even around an entire book or chapter or even the entire Bible. Context can apply to a particular book, to a particular type of literature, to a particular type of author, the whole Old or New Testament, it can be applied to the entire Bible. In the study of a particular book of the Bible, context really takes on two forms. First of all, you have the literary form or the literary context, which is talking about the type of literature. And then you have the historical or cultural context, which is the background. It is a fact that God chose to speak through human writers to address real-life needs of a particular people at a particular time and place in a particular culture. The question is not whether God has given us relevant principles. We know that. The question is how God chose to do so. 
And this is important because all too often, we read the Bible through a Western lens. We read the Bible from our perspective, from our culture, from our time and place, forgetting that the Bible was not written to you. The Bible was written for you, but the Bible was not written to you. You cannot discount or discredit the things that are going on around what you're reading. You cannot make this only apply to you. There are relevant principles. I'm not saying that. And I'm certainly not saying that the Bible is not applicable in this day and age. But you cannot forget context. Our interpretive approach should properly take into account the way God chose to communicate the Scriptures in the first place. And it's vitally important to keep in mind that that each portion of Scripture was God's Word to someone else before it was God's Word to you. We have to consider that. We cannot leave the original readers and circumstances out of the equation or we're going to miss a whole lot. And this is a major, a major flaw that happens in our Bible study today. Historical context has a major bearing on interpretation because the meaning of a passage is what God intended to a certain people at a certain time in a certain place. Romans wasn't written to you. Romans was written to the Romans. Just as Corinthians was written to the Corinthians. You see what I'm saying here? You cannot forget about the original audience and what was going on in that place and time. So we must first determine what is meant, what what was meant to those who first received the letter. What was God trying to get across to them? Before we ever make some interpretive leap to our culture. Historical cultural context has to do with the writer, the readers, and the circumstances that were surrounding that time and place. Then you have comparison. Comparing Scripture with Scripture is a great idea because Scripture is often its own best interpreter, right? The more we compare Scripture with Scripture, the more evident meaning becomes. Sound interpretation always, and underline always, takes into account the whole teaching of Scripture regarding a particular topic or a theme or a concept. If you're studying baptism, and all you have studied is John chapter 3 and verse 16, then you are not doing proper Bible study. You are not seeking to incorporate the whole of Scripture. If all you consider on the subject of baptism is Acts 2 and 38, you have not done a proper rendering of that passage as well as the passages that surround it. You have not completely and totally dug in to find out what it means to be baptized, and what the salvation process includes. You cannot accept just one passage or two passages of Scripture and leave it at that. This is what happens so often is we decide, okay, here's what I believe, and we go to the Scriptures and we find one passage that supports it. And that's where we rest. That's where we hang our hat. And we do this with a variety of different topics. And usually, the one passage we picked out has nothing to do with what we had in mind anyway. It just mentions the Word, and therefore we run with it. That's lazy. It's erroneous. It's a disservice to the Word of God. Here are some key questions that we can ask when interpreting words, phrases, or concepts. I don't think I put that one up there, Zinni, so I don't mean to make you go looking for it. I don't think I put it up here. Here's some key questions to ask when interpreting words, phrases, and concepts. Number one, how does the particular writer use the word or the phrase or the concept in other parts of the book? How does the particular writer use the word, phrase, or concept in other books that he has written? Number three, does this word, phrase, or concept have more than one usage? And if so, what are they? What is the most frequent way this word, phrase, or concept is used? Does the context give any clue to its meaning? Is the word, phrase, or concept compared or contrasted with another thing in the context? And is there any illustration in the context that helps clarify the meaning? You come across a word like propitiation. 
Maybe you wonder, what does that word mean? Was it used in other places? Did the writer use it in other places? You know, for instance, we find it in, in, in John. Do, do we see it used in other places in, other than 1 John? Do we find it in other places? Does John use a similar word? That's what we're talking about here when we talk about comparison. Comparison also includes making sure that if we use like a concordance, we use one that's exhaustive and not abridged like Strong's Concordance or Young's Concordance are both good. If we're going to use a concordance, we need to select a concordance based on the translation that we most use. If I mostly use the English Standard Version, then I should have a concordance that, that matches that. Do we know what a concordance is? I'm not, I, I may be assuming some things. A concordance just has an exhaustive list of particular words in the Bible and where they're found. And that can be a great tool to use in comparison. Now, we've got to be careful because like we tell our preacher training camp kids, if you're someone that's teaching a Bible class or maybe preaching a sermon, don't preach a concordant sermon. And we, tell our, we caution our preacher training camp kids about this because you can tell that preacher who got up and all he did was go to the concordance and find every time a certain word is mentioned and he preaches every Every scripture on that. I had somebody come to me one time after a, a lesson and say, you know, I liked your lesson, but uh, you, know, you, didn't, you didn't use this scripture and you didn't use that scripture. And I said, yeah, because I wasn't trying to give an exhaustive list of all the scriptures. You know, I, I, I want to hit the point, but I'm, I'm not going to do concordance preaching, right? And we want to stay away from that. But a concordance can be very helpful in our daily Bible study because it helps us to find particular words and where they're used and how they're used in several different passages. Another thing is culture. This is highly important. The culture of a people has to do with what a particular group may think, believe, say, do, make, all of those things. You know, the first time I traveled to Mexico City, I realized that I was, for the first time in my life, a minority. I didn't look like anybody there. Uh, among 30 million people, I was the only one that I saw that had my color hair, my color eyes, my color skin. And there's a culture shock in a lot of other ways. You don't speak the language. The food is different. You know, I didn't realize until I went to Mexico City, you, they don't have burritos. You know, it's not like a Taco Bell menu. I mean, it's very different food. And so you're, you're really out of place. And you have to understand something about culture. You know, just like the way they answer the phone, what they say when they, when they leave. You know, they, when they leave a room, you know, they don't necessarily say goodbye. You know, sometimes they say salud. And, you know, you have, you have certain cultural things that you pick up on. But it can be quite a shock when you go somewhere where you don't necessarily fit in. When we go to the Bible, we're going to a foreign place. We're considering culture. We may be puzzled by what we read. It may be difficult to navigate, but it's vital that we know something of the people, their thoughts, how they lived, how they talked, what they did, etc. All of this can influence us, but it was first influenced by their culture. What these people did, how they interacted, was all influenced by their culture. We need to consider carefully the context and the culture in which a passage was first written. You see this in action sometimes when you take maybe some friends who had never been on a mission trip to a foreign country. You take them somewhere like a third world country, even you know, when we'd take folks to Mexico City, they'd never been out of the country and they come to church that morning and they're flabbergasted because it's not exactly the way they do church in America. Nothing wrong. They don't do anything that's unscriptural. It's just not the same. And we've even had instances where we had to calm some folks down and say, hey, yo, what are you doing? Quit go over there and berating people. You're, you're in their territory. They're not wrong. Leave them alone. But they wanted to Americanize the church, whether it's in Mexico or Ghana or wherever. They wanted to Americanize it because this was not, this was not common to them. It was foreign. Consider culture. You know, in our culture, we tend to be more formal when we come to worship. We tend to wear suits and ties if we're guys. We tend to wear dresses if we're ladies. Go to church in Hawaii, you won't find that. Go to church in Ghana, maybe you find that some. But in Mexico City, they didn't dress up like that. Most of the time, they couldn't afford it. When we went to El Salvador and I preached in, in El Salvador, they said, don't wear a suit. These folks don't wear clothing like that. They can't afford it, you know. And, uh, you know, let's, let's dress like them. 
Not that they didn't dress nice, but there's a cultural aspect there. And we have to recognize that, especially when it comes to the Bible. Culture includes politics. It includes religion. It includes economy. It includes legality, agriculture. It includes geography, domestic, military, social mores, anything that makes a people unique. For instance, you talk about political. In Daniel chapter 5, verse 7, as well as Daniel 5 and 16, the king called loudly to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers. The king declared to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then in verse 16, but I have heard that you can give interpretations and solve problems. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. And so if we're considering culture, we ask the question, why did the king offer the position of third in command to Daniel? Why not, why not second? Why not first? Secular history tells us that Belshazzar himself was actually second in command. His father was out of the country for a long period of time, leaving Belshazzar in charge. So that's just one minute detail of the political that we can dive into and help us to maybe understand the passage a little bit. If nothing else, give us a little background information. Then you have the religious. In Kings, uh, 1 Kings 18 and 19, it says, Now therefore send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel, and the 450 prophets of, of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. You remember this whole incident that happened with Elijah calling out the prophets of Baal? And, and uh, yeah, if you ever read that, it's really kind of comical even what Elijah has to say because the prophets of Baal failed miserably, right? But you look at this passage and you say, why did Elijah suggest Mount Carmel as the site for the contest with Baal's prophets? Well, you do a little investigating, you see the answer is confirmed through archaeology. Followers of Baal believed that Mount Carmel was a dwelling place of their God, and so Elijah was, was giving them the home field advantage. He was letting them operate on their home turf, and if they couldn't perform, which they wouldn't, on their home turf, what does that say about them? He was giving them every advantage possible, and they still failed the test. You look at the legal, and you know, we talk about legality, in 2 Kings 2 and 9, it says, When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. So what did Elisha mean when he asked for a double portion of Elijah's spirit? Well, if you understand the culture, he was stating that he wanted to be Elijah's successor and his heir. And according to Deuteronomy 21, 17, the firstborn of a family was to receive a double portion of the father's estate. If you look at the domestic conditions surrounding a culture, in Job 3 and 12 it says, why did the knees receive me or why the breast that I should nurse? And you think, why would Job say something like this? Job said a lot of things that are hard to understand, but here we see that a newborn child was placed on a grandfather's knee as a symbol that the child was in his line. You see sometimes the figure of a fig tree and, and people going and sitting underneath it. A fig tree was a sign of prosperity, which helps you to kind of understand the cultural context a little better. Now again, am I suggesting that every time you read the Bible, you have to dig into all of these things? And Well, not necessarily. But I think so many times our reading of the Bible is cursory. We have our Bible reading plan, we read our three chapters that day, and then we move on. But if God has told us something, I want to know what he said, right? If he intends for us to process something, I want to know what it is. And that's where consultation comes in, the last C. When you have consultation, it means that you use other resources to help you. You know, you have some people that say, well, all I need is the Bible. Well, to a degree, that's very true, right? But none of us have only needed the Bible, right? Ever. Ever. All of us have gone to other people that we respect. We've listened to other teachers and preachers that gave us different uh, interpretations that maybe we've used or we've tossed aside. Maybe we've consulted commentaries, Bible encyclopedias, whatever it may be. While the Bible is truly all we need, we can't truly understand the Bible by itself always. And so we need other helps. I know that 
some folks feel uncomfortable using anything other than the version they use or any tool or resource that wasn't written by a Church of Christ author. And I would suggest to you, you may be doing yourself a little bit of a disservice there. Now, sometimes you have to wade through some things. Certainly, uh, like I talked about a couple of weeks ago, I use uh, William Barclay's commentaries quite often because of the history aspect. He's terrible on doctrine, and I would never use him for doctrine. But I like the history, and I like what he has to say concerning the traditions and the customs of the time. There are some things that you might have to wade through, but I would caution you being too narrow in your study and, and assuming that, that only one or two people can give you something that you can use. We mustn't be so arrogant as to believe that no one else can offer any other insight. Truth is truth. I don't care who says it. And there are people that may not be uh, on the same page as you spiritually or religiously that can say truth. Don't you believe that? You know, there are folks who have preached in churches of Christ that have since turned uh, away from the church, who have become atheists, but what they wrote before then was truth, and it's still truth, because that's not dependent on who said it, right? I mean, if a six-year-old child says truth, it's truth. God's Word is truth, no matter who said it, no matter where it comes from, and so there is other insight to be gleaned out there. We just have to be careful. Like I've said, when, when, using, uh, when using Bible commentaries or when using uh, Bible study aids. Just remember, uh, you know, study Bibles, a lot of times those are written with a denominational slant or bias. So you got to be careful. And you may have to wade through some things, but there is other information out there that can be very helpful. So um, tools to have in your tool chest, a concordance, Bible dictionary, Bible encyclopedia, word studies, commentaries, if you use Logos, the online software, that's a good tool. There's a lot of different tools out there. Don't regulate yourself to just one, and please don't be afraid to use some of these. But, of course, all this is going to be dependent upon your knowledge and how much you're studying and how much you're, you're training spiritually because you can be tossed around by every wind of doctrine if you're not careful, right? Right? So you've got to have reliable sources, and you've got to have the knowledge to be able to wade through some things for some of this. So in conclusion, I, I just want to say, when it comes to interpretation, don't be lazy. I think all too often Christians are lazy with Bible study. They just want to read it for what it is right on the surface, and they never want to dig any deeper. Bible study is tough, it's arduous, it's laborious at times, but it's worth it. Because if God is communicating with me, I want to know exactly what he says, don't you? And it doesn't matter what I want him to say. It doesn't matter what some Bible professor or even some preacher has to say. I want to know what he means so that I can take it and apply it to my life because that is what he intends. I want to be reading from the same script that God is reading from. I want to be doing what he's trying to communicate. And if that's our goal, then that's a worthy goal. If you're here tonight and you want to study the Bible with somebody, let's set that up. If you need prayers for any reason or